It does. There's a couple of people coming in. Yep. Good evening. Good evening and welcome to the regularly scheduled board meeting of the Granville Exemptive Village School District. It's nice to see everyone here this evening. Uh, would you please uh, rise and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please take the roll. Mr. Jennings. Hi. Mr. Miller. Here. Mr. Corman. Here. Ms. Deeds. Here. Our first order of business is something that um, that we are very uh, excited about, and we are pleased that you are here with us this evening to see. Um, as you may well know, we've had a vacancy uh, on our uh, board membership uh, for the last two months. We've gone through a lengthy process, um, which I'll explain in a moment, but uh, at this time I would entertain a motion to nominate a successor to the open board. So <laughs> it would be kind of helpful to say who you're yeah. nominated. Oh, <laughs> I would be proud to nominate Fred Wolf. I second the motion. Uh, so before we vote on that, let me take a, take a moment uh, to explain to you uh, what we've done. Andrew Cohn, a, an elected board member, resigned when he moved out of the district. Uh, we published uh, in a lot of local media the fact that we were um, seeking to replace him. We received 11 applications uh, for that position. Uh, we conducted 10 interviews. One of the applicants uh, withdrew prior to the interview process. We spend in excess of five hours interviewing um, the 10 applicants for the position. We were extraordinarily pleased with the depth, breadth, and quality of the uh, applicants for this position. It's uh, very um, comforting and encouraging to know that there are so many wonderful people in this district who are willing to put themselves out uh, for that position. And, and we frankly struggled mightily uh, trying to narrow that uh, 10 down to one. Uh, is the option of expanding our board with a will. Um, we spent uh, the better part of two um, meetings in executive session discussing the various candidates, uh, discussing their responses to our questions, and, and in fact the questions they posed to us, which were, um, which were terrific and caused us to review and think about what we do as, a, as an administrative body, as a board, as a governing body, and as a school district. Um, and at the end of that process, um, we arrived at what I believe is a consensus uh, on the nominee to the board. And, and that person is, as Ms. Deeds has indicated, is Fred Wolf. So if, if uh, there's any other discussion or comments from any of my fellow board members, I would open up there. I'm, I'm just so pleased with the range of folks that came out and again you know, many of us said wow they would be as qualified as myself <laughs> and, uh, and I hope that those individuals that were not selected uh, for this nomination will be considered to be engaged in some other way we have a lot of great opportunities in the school district for all community members to be engaged through our superintendents committees through other activities with the school through leadership of various organizations and so there's great opportunities and that's really what makes this district tick is the connection that we have with so many of our community members and the care and the time that they put into education and so thank you to all that interviewed and thank you to all in the community that spent so much time and energy uh, looking forward to moving forward with the full board uh, in the future to continue the great work. Uh, Fred and his wife, uh, Diana, uh, have three kids who graduated from the Granville schools. They've lived in the district for 19 years and uh, I could spend the next 30 minutes reciting to you the litany of volunteer activities that Fred has engaged in over the uh, 
course of his time here in Granville. Um, suffice to say that he has been um, clearly someone who is committed uh, not only to the community, uh, as evidenced by his work with the Kiwanis and the Rec District, but to Granville schools. Um, in, with his work in the athletic boosters, with his work as a volunteer coach, uh, with his work uh, supporting everything that we do uh, as a school uh, district. And so I'm thrilled to welcome, I'm presuming the vote, I'm thrilled to welcome uh, my friends to the board. So with that, I would uh, ask Mr. Solis to call the vote. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Mr. Janice. Aye. Yeah. Okay. Bear with us for a moment. We have to now update our uh, no, oath, no, oath of office. Oath of office. Oh, oath of office. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, right. You're not official. You solemnly swear that you will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Ohio, and that you will faithfully and impartially discharge your duties as a member of the Board of Education of the Granville Exempted Village School District, Licking County, Ohio, to the best of your ability and in accordance with the laws now in effect and here and after to be enacted during your continuance in said office and until your successor is elected and qualified. I will. You have a pen. I do. <laughs> <laughs> I have my pen over there. <laughs> Sign here. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, now I'll ask you just bear with us for a moment. We have to do a photo to update the website. <laughs> where are we going? That's where do you want us? Right here? <coughs> do I have to get in this too? Yes. Do well, I have a choice? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Oh. <laughs> huh? That's why we had the Somebody's hugged the chair. Don't you want somebody here? <laughs> 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 one more for <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your patience. And then before we get started, does anybody who wants an agenda that didn't get one? There's more agendas. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I Thank you. Yes. I'm serious. I know. <laughs> GRDs isn't quite as intense. <laughs> but we do have an oath. This brings us to the commendation section of our board agenda, um, where we commend certain staff, students, and community members for uh, exemplary performance or service to the community. So our Blue Aces competed in winter sports and had a great season. So we are proud of their efforts. Tonight, we'd like to recognize athletes on the wrestling and swim teams who competed at the state level. So our wrestlers were Douglas Terry, who is, was the first GHS freshman in program history to qualify for the state wrestling tournament. And Keegan Van Meter, uh, who also competed in the state tournament at 170 pounds. Congratulations for representing GHS, and please come up with Coach Bergeron. Ready. You know, my dad was a wrestling coach for many years. 
that's why I say that's not Oh, no, now I am. What <laughs> 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 The board would also like to congratulate four swim team members who competed at the state swim meet. Sarah Martin swam the 100, 200 uh, freestyle, and the 400 freestyle relay. Uh, Alexander Speck, Hannah Sturgeon, and Brianna White uh, all swam in the 400 freestyle relay. And please come up with your coaches, Hillary and Tyler. and what it does to build discipline, perseverance, and, and really round out the educational process in Grandpa schools. Um, it takes a ton of time and dedication, and these students are great athletes, but they're also great students. So congratulations. I know it takes a lot of work and effort and, and dedication, so congratulations. We really are proud of you, so thank you. Uh, next, we'd like to represent or uh, congratulate and commend a group of GHS teachers who do a fantastic job every year with the Senior Global Awareness Project. Um, so I'm going to introduce them in a minute, but the Global Awareness Project really has been a project that morphed with project-based learning. And so it's a multidisciplinary process that our seniors go through to really do exactly what it says develop a better awareness of global issues and um, research them, try and find solutions, and in some circumstances take action to resolve those. Uh, but these teachers go above and beyond to try and set the, the students up for success by connecting with Ohio State professors and students at Ohio State with Denison professors. Uh, um, you know, Beth Simmons, I know you're out there somewhere. Um, <laughs> she works her tail off to try and find students that have a first-person perspective of what other what uh, what country students are studying. And so I think it's um, a multidisciplinary team that really puts together a great process for our students right before they graduate. Um, some would call it a capstone project, but I think it's a life project. So uh, we'd like to recognize um, Jim Redding, Lori Hudson, Adam Teeters, Ryan Schweiger, uh, Sally Gummery, Derek Hall, and Beth Simmons. Come on. from each district in, the Lincoln, in Lincoln County with the You Make a Difference Award. For 2018, the Granville School's honoree is Derek Fisher, GHS Latin teacher. The purpose of the award is to recognize and honor each recipient for his or her outstanding effort to make a difference in the lives of students. Any teacher from pre-kindergarten through 12th grade is eligible. Derek was nominated by McKinley Kramer for going be above and beyond the Latin curriculum to teach students life lessons about what they need to know in this world. Congratulations, Barry. Thank <laughs> you. 
Uh, yes, I do. Okay, uh, next we have our student report. The student report is an opportunity to hear from students. Um, usually we have a student body president or somebody um, come to talk about what's been going on at GHS or around the district. Um, but I had the pleasure of listening to a couple of students talk about saving the bees. And I said, you know what? I would love to have you come and talk a little bit about your project uh, with the board because we have been involved in a lot of project-based learning in Granville schools, and it's an opportunity for us to um, connect the dots between the board, the administration, and the students about what, what work they're doing. So um, I'd like to invite our student representatives from the B project up to the microphone. You do not have a PowerPoint, right? Oh, you do? Okay. okay. Well, um, yeah, we can we can get you. I also brought honey. All right. I'm not lost on the coloring either. Yellow. What did he say? I lost on the coloring. She's just a little organic honey from the All right. And if you could talk into the microphone, that would be fantastic. And make sure you introduce who you are. <laughs> I need a straw. <laughs> <laughs> Dress me up, you can't take me out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. Yeah. It's worth a lot of doing people. It's really good. Where we show up, where we show up. That, that doesn't constitute a bribe. Okay. I got it. It's calories. It doesn't count. Apparently, they already have their funding secured. Okay. Yeah. yeah. From, well, my business. So. <laughs> yeah, but you get a, um, you know, mostly proofing. Okay, so you've set a new standard. Every every student group now has to bring a treat. Um, so thank you. You can go ahead and get started, and that way we'll catch up with the te technology. Sure. sure. Uh, I'm Megan Coffey. I'm a senior at Granville School. It's working. Okay. <laughs> Catherine Gross, also a senior. Uh, I'm Claire Duncan, and I'm a junior. And this is Emily Neal, and she is a sophomore. Um, and today we're presenting to you our Take Action project through uh, Mr. Redding's AP Enviro class. Um, for our Take Action project, we decided to implement a bee apiary in our treasured land lab at uh, Granville Intermediate. Uh, we would, through our plan, we plan to um, implement five hives of bees um, in phase 3.1 of the land lab, which we will show you on our map. Um, this, uh, these bees will provide unmatched pollination to our prairies and all of the uh, greenland surrounding the intermediate school. And um, it will set up a plan for the future to possibly harvest honey to use in our cafeterias and to possibly sell at the farmer's market to create revenue. So, um. Um, so a lot of the Take Action project is not only like our student involvement, but student involvement for like future students and down the road. So since Catherine and I are seniors and there's um, another senior or two on our group, um, you know, that just leaves Claire and Emily. Uh, we've talked to Mr. Redding, and there's ways to get, um, you know, managing the bees, um, more um, a sustainable student-run kind of project. Uh, kids can do it as part of enrichment assignments that they do for Mr. Redding's class. Um, 
So we're really trying to make sure it'll, because like bees always have a problem where they die over the winter. So we definitely wanted to make sure they survived, but also keep student involvement because it's a great learning opportunity. So. Okay. The honey's good. <laughs> yeah, the honey's very good. So, tell us how long you've been working on the project. Um, so we started all year. Yeah. Uh, we've been working on it all year, and um, some of the goals we want to get out of this project. Number one, um, as far as environmentally, uh, bees are incredibly important to the whole world, and uh, as pollinators, they do a lot of work for most plants that you see outside and so um, then they're kind of threatened as a species and they've their population has been dropping and so um, anything we can do to help that is a big goal of ours um, and also uh, education with uh, bees and pollination and all of that aspects of nature we want to provide that education to the students of Granville so um, and uh, ever since like you're a little kid, um, it's common for people to be afraid of bees. Um, but the honeybees that we'll be using, Italian honeybees, they're very docile and calm bees. Uh, and they're not prone to stinging because they only get one sting and then they're gone. So it's only if they feel threatened that they will sting. And the placement of our hives is as far away from the intermediate school playground as possible to provide for safety. And we're currently working with Mrs. Burris to, once we implement our actual hives, to be able to go into the intermediate school and give a presentation about what we've done and about the bees and how to be safe around them. Because they're really kind bees, and if you're kind to them, they'll become kind back. So... Uh, so as we kind of talked about our plan, we're putting uh, five hives in phase 3.1 of the land lab and we want to, our goal is to educate the kids in Granville schools on the importance of bees in the environment. Um, so as you can see right towards the top where the cursor is now circling is where the bees will go in regards to the area of the land lab. Um, we kind of talked about this too already, but why bees? They're pollinators. They're really important for most of the plants on Earth. Um, education for Granville students. Uh, helping a threatened species, we want to help them because as they are so important for our environment, it's really important that we keep them alive and thriving. And we hope in future years, students will continue with this project and uh, hopefully collect honey from the hives one day to be used um, in the cafeteria and as well as uh, maybe sales, uh, selling them to community members. Um, yeah. um, so right now we currently have our budget all figured out. Uh, we just recently met with the Kiwanis of Granville about a grant opportunity uh, to fund this project. And it looks like the money we'll receive from Kiwanis and the money uh, we already have from the Land Lab Fund will be able to cover all uh, five hives worth of bees and the necessary equi equipment we'll need. Um, my father was actually a beekeeper for seven years and had to retire due to allergies. Um, but uh, he's offered to build us the hives, and he has great experience with that. Um, so currently, our entire project is funded. Uh, the only new funding would be needed if um, they wanted to future students want to implement honey harvesting, which requires more equipment. <coughs> um, we've also reached out in the community uh, with this project, and we're currently working on a deal with uh, uh, the Bee Barons. They're a local beekeeping um, company in Newark, and they're going to be supplying us with the bees and giving us discounted prices on our uh, necessary equipment. And uh, yeah, uh, we plan to reach out to the neighbors of the land lab. Um, there's a one neighbor who actually, I believe, keeps bees. So um, it'll be interesting to work with them. And um, 
again, just educating Granville as a community. Thank you for your time. Thank you. <laughs>
just kind of an overview of what's required by law and what we do specifically in Granville. Well, I really like the coordinating outfits with the yellow for the bees, and I'm thinking maybe I should have worn like red or something, green and yellow. I don't know. <laughs> I'm in pink tonight, so hold on just a minute. Okay, so I heard Mr. Brown talk about the uh, approval process and how um, we go through this annually to review our safety plan. And actually this year, we are in the three-year cycle. Um, every three years, the plan is sent to the State Department and is in, under a full evaluation. So we will be um, meeting, as he said, April 4th and submitting the plan in May for the Homeland Security to look at and approve. Um, he also mentioned that I would be speaking in generalities about the plan because the plan is only intended for our school personnel and our emergency responders. <clears throat> so we are required by the state to have a safety plan and listed on this slide are the various components of the safety plan. So I'm going to walk through those just so that you understand a little bit more about what the contents are. Um, first, we have our emergency contact list. This lists all of the essential uh, school personnel, the administrators. It also lists our facilities manager as well as our emergency personnel, first responders, and their contact list. We also have a site plan that we're required to have. And each one of these that I talk about are all separate entities. So those are all um, uploaded separately and accessible by our first responders um, individually so they don't have to sort through um, a more lengthy plan, which is the emergency operation plan. So our site plan is an aerial view of the school and the surrounding buildings. We are required to identify uh, street names, address, phone number, and also put a compass on that uh, site plan so that we can see what direction the uh, facility is located. We are also new this year going to need to locate fire hydrants and assembly points uh, where the students would gather outside of the site. We also have to submit a floor plan, and on the floor plan we need to introduce the same basic information about the school. Um, we need to have a compass. We need to have separate sheets for each plan, for each floor. So for the high school we have two floor plans. We have to identify all building exits, all rooms by number, all offices, the area for the utilities where they are shut off. We have to identify all locations for fire extinguishers, security cameras, and the location of our AEDs. In addition, we have to identify the area for refuge. So if there is a student or a staff that cannot make it down the stairs, there, we have to identify an area where they can wait until emergency personnel can arrive. The emergency operation plan is what we often refer to as the safety plan. And I'll kind of re refer to that as the meats and potatoes of the plan. That is what we will do in different scenarios that we may hopefully never come across. But if we do, we will be prepared to do so. We also have a signature page that we need to include when, in our submission to the state. We have to have a variety of people participating on our review team. Um, that includes the chief of police, our fire chief, um, an official from the county emergency management agency, administrators, school counselors, teachers, parents, some of our secretaries, nurses, our facility manager, and then we have some representatives from Denison that are all on our team. So now I will go through all of the components that are actually in the emergency operation plan that we're required to have by the state. We, um, we have an overview of each site. We include demographic information for each school, such as the number of students, uh, the number of teachers and staff. We have to identify the number of students that might have disabilities and what those um, categories may be. Um, we have to identify the purpose of the plan, how to activate the plan. And of course, we have to identify all of our utility contact information for gas, electric, water, internet, trash, food service, just about anything you can think of, we have to have that information in that plan. We have a, a section on prevention, um, and that details the training on the plan. Um, new, we will have to have some additional training through NIMS, which is the National Incident Management System. And we also have to list the dr drill requirements and the reporting of those drills under that section. The next section is the protection and mitigation piece. 
we have to do a hazard analysis to determine what threats we may need to plan for. And I'm not going to name all of them, but I will name several that we do need to have plans for. Um, an active shooter, a bomb threat, bus accident, fire, tornado, a hostage, hostage situation, chemical accident, death, medical emergency, and as I said, many more. We also have to have response and recovery for each one of those that I mentioned and the others that we have in our plan. We have to have an incident command center, roles and responsibilities, emergency communication system during and after the event. We have to have our evacuation and family reunification plans. <clears throat> we also have to have the plan administration, um, which talks about the approval and review process. It talks about the committee requirements and the people that are required to be on the committee. It talks about the cycle that I men mentioned earlier for the evaluation plan um, and also the annual review plot process. And we have to keep record of whom we disseminate the plan to. Um, they have to sign off on the plan when they received it. And we have to keep record of any changes by date and submit all of that to the state. Navigate Prepared is a web-based platform. And we also have an app for it that is for our staff to use. Um, the web-based platform houses all of the documents that I just mentioned to you. Um, the people that have access to the web-based platform our administrators within the school district and emergency personnel. The floor plans are probably the most um, interesting or uh, utilized, I guess, feature that we would be needing in an emergency event because it has an overlay for different components that we are required to identify. What I mean by that is it'll have a floor plan and then there will be icons across the top. And if we need to identify where the AEDs are located, we would click on that icon. All of the AEDs would populate onto the floor plan. Um, then we can click on the AEDs again, and they will go off. Um, we have cameras. We're required to locate where the cameras are on our floor plan. So if you were to click on the camera icon, all of the cameras would populate the floor plan. And then you can actually click on the camera, and you can see the video feed for that area that you're looking at. So that is extremely beneficial for emergency situations where the emergency personnel or administrators could easily identify what cameras and what areas they need to look at if there was an emergency situation. I want to emphasize that those are only accessible to administrators and um, personnel, emergency personnel, and we do have data. We can see who has been um, logged in and watching videos, and it's only used for situations that would warrant that. There are also photos of each classroom, um, and they have a 360-degree view of those classrooms. And the Navigate app is what our staff has on their phones if they have a smartphone. If they don't have a smartphone, then they have a flip chart, um, a hard copy of that. If you can see in the right-hand corner, that is a picture of what our app looks like. Um, teachers have that downloaded on their phone. And each one of those different colors is one of those hazards that I mentioned earlier. So for example, there's one up there that has listed tornado. So if we needed to know what to do in a tornado situation, we would just touch that and then it would slide over and it shows all the directions for what you should do in that situation. Now obviously, this is not something that we hope that we ever need to use in an emergency situation, nor would do we think that our teachers, if there is an active shooter, which I hope that there never is, that they would have time to go to their phones and hit, what do I do with an active shooter, and then respond. This is more for a training piece so that they know what to do when that does happen. And we do practice these quite frequently, which I will get to in just a minute. But this, once you download this, you don't have to have Wi-Fi capability or cell phone access to be able to see the plans. And this is only for our staff. Our drills. We have fire drills monthly. Um, we have tornado drills April th through June, of course, when we are in session. Um, we have safety drills three times a year, plus we do one theoretical drill with the students. Every year we practice an evacuation and then we go to the reunifi reunification site. We alternate years between seventh through 12th grade and through K, K6. So this year we did an evacuation to the reunification site for seven through 12. Last year we did one for K through six. When we practice the evacuation, it is accompanied with training. 
Um, we also are heart safe, safe, heart safe accredited, and along with that heart safe accreditation, we have four emergency medical drills per year. This allows us to practice implementing our emergency, emergency medical team uh, using our CPR skills and the AED. This also uh, allows us, once a year we practice where the um, emergency personnel will actually transition from taking care of the patient to um, us transferring that to the emergency personnel. So that's a very beneficial activity and we're lucky that our fire department will do that with us. Training. We have uh, school active shooter training. Uh, we partner with the local sheriff's office to train uh, teachers and students, 7 through 12, like I said, when that happens with the evacuation drill, where we go to the reunification site. We spend um, really the whole day on training um, and then the evacuation. Uh, four years ago, I think it was four or five years ago, the entire staff was trained. Um, and now we partner with the ESC that every time in the orientation in August, when we have new employees, we train all of those new employees on the process. We're going to um, host it again this year. Last year, we hosted it for its first time. We also train all of our staff on CPR and first aid. Um, they were initially trained three years ago. Uh, last year, we did the recertification because the certification, of course, is only good for two years. It's also embedded into the orientation program that we have for our new employees. So all of our staff are trained with uh, CPR and first aid, and we're very proud of that. Our teachers and all of our staff actually participate in um, modules on public schools work. Um, these are courses that they need to take at the beginning of each school year. They have a wide range of topics, and just to name a few, although we have some teachers in here that I know could name several more, um, we do review CPR and first aid, we review the Heimlich maneuver, we review caring for diabetic students, um, we also have student medical emergencies, which includes training on the EpiPens. We have several tools and resources in our schools to help support our um, safety initiatives. We have AEDs, and we are very fortunate in this. We have two to three in each school building. We have one at the soccer, softball concessions area. We have one at the football concessions, one at the hen indoor hitting facility by the baseball field. We have one that travels with the trainer, and we have two that can travel with the coaches if they have practice off, off of our campus. We also have go buckets in every room. This, uh, this was um, initiated uh, several years ago by the high school staff, and they partnered with local uh, first responders to put together that. The go bucket contains um, basically some medical first aid equipment that they can use in an emergency situation. We also have cameras throughout our buildings. Um, and we are currently working with the sheriff's office and our local fire department to um, implement some barricading devices for our classrooms. Communication. Communication can be tricky at times. Um, and over the past two years, we have purchased new handheld radios for um, our staff, not for all of our staff, but for our administrators, guidance counselors, um, essential people that are in the office or near offices that we need to communicate across the district and across the school building. We have two different kinds of radios right now that are in each building. One radio, one radio type can communicate across the entire school building. Like the elementary school has several radios that they can communicate in that building. We also have another type of radio that communicates with those older radios, I'll say, and then it also communicates across the district. So we have radios here in our office that we can communicate with the administrators or whoever has a radio over at the intermediate school, which is pretty powerful for whenever we need to communicate quickly about something. We also have the Marks radio system. These are in all of our front offices of our school buildings. Basically, it allows us to press a button and have immediate communication with first responders. We also have a PA system to use for announcements related to any safety concerns. Obviously, they're used for daily announcements, but we do rely on them if we have any situation that needs to be addressed. Any employee can also use the phone to make an announcement in an emergency situation. They can an initiate medical emergency response team. We have been replacing our PA systems. Um, in fact, the elementary school 
be replaced in the next uh, couple of weeks. We've had some failures in that area because of the age of the equipment. Uh, we replaced the, the middle school, school um, last summer. And I would just like to ask the board if they have any questions about any of our safety plans or safety items or any thoughts that they'd like for me to take back to our safety committee when we meet on the 4th. Bonnie, thanks for the report. Um, you mentioned the aggregate training. Uh, you referenced that we've done it to 712. Mm -hmm. uh, are we not doing a K6? If not, what's the rationale? We do the training K6, but it's, it doesn't look the same for the younger, for the younger kids. We, we don't want to scare the kids, but we <laughs> want them to understand what their response should be. Thanks. So it does look different. That's what I want to do. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else have questions? Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'll be up Next. again in a few minutes. You are actually oh, right now. <laughs> Transition and move on. All right. Now I get to talk about food. Yes. So I, I will start to tee you up for this next report. Um, the Wellness Com Committee update. If you remember several months ago, we had a couple of um, community members come and talk a little bit about uh, food in the classroom and uh, in, through public comment and um, I was directed to, you know, involve them in the student wellness um, committee that is active and continuing to be active uh, that Tanya facilitates. So um, this presentation is a result of that committee working um, over the last couple of months to make some potentially uh, some proposed policy revisions. As you know, with any policy decision, there's a first reading, a second reading, and then an action item. This is just an informational session for you as a board. Okay, thank you. So as I said, now we're going to be talking about food, changing the gears, but we're still talking about safety. And our wellness committee um, has been meeting this year to review our student wellness program. Um, and our main focus has been to promote healthy living, obviously, and student safety. Um, we have met three times, and we have, um, I have two of my members here tonight. I have Marie and John Bishop, so thank you for coming to support our um, recommendation to the Board of Education. During our meetings, we took some time to do an analysis of our current policy, which the last revision was in 2012. Um, we did what we called a SWOT analysis, analysis, which was to look at the strengths, weaknesses, obstacles, on, and threats. However, I like to call the threats challenges. I just don't like the word threat. It sounds intimidating. So I'm just going to name a few of those um, that we identified. Strengths. Some of the strengths of our current plan is that it promotes healthy learning environment. It did improve the healthiness and quality of food that students were served, and it also focused on nutrition. Some weaknesses. We felt that the policy needed a list of healthy snacks. And then we also felt that the rewards incentives should not be food-based. We also felt that the plan had opportunities for growth. We felt that it could uh, do a better job of teaching long-term healthy eating mm -hmm. habits and that we could provide parents better notification about foods being in the classroom so that they could plan alternatives for those, um, those times. We also thought some challenges would be for the um, enforcement of policy across the district and also communication. Um, based on that, a much, much, much longer list from our analysis, um, we developed some of these pro policy revisions and some ideas for implementing the policy. We felt that it would be important to include the policy in student handbooks, also to communicate the policy quarterly um, in principal and teacher newsletters, to make sure that we share a list of healthy snacks with parents and ha house that on our website. Um, provide suggestions for alternatives to activities that typically focus on food. Also provide a consistent message across the district through work with the leadership team. Here's an overview of the recommended changes. I'll just read through these. Um, we removed the part that talks about one, one sweet treat for classroom parties. 
Remo gosh, we removed, I feel like Ryan Bernath saying real world. <laughs> 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 we removed uh, food as a reward or incentive. We moved the language around, around um, so that it was a better um, understood policy. There were some contradictions we felt in the 2012 version. We updated some suggestions for ways to celebrate individual and or group parties. Um, we also will, the committee will provide a list of healthy snack options. We added the two days for parent notification prior to food at special occasion, again, just to allow parents time to provide an alternative. We added that assignments associated with food should allow for alternatives for students with allergies. Uh, we added that non-food items for Valentine should be considered for Valentine's Day treats. Um, ideas that could go with their cards that they exchange would be keychains, um, pencils, or silly straws. We also put that um, Play-Doh, Slime, and Silly Putty should not be in the classroom because those do contain gluten and are harmful to our students that have uh, allergies. This by no means is an all-inclusive list, but it is a list of some healthy snacks um, that could be used in the classroom. What is highlighted here is a hyperlink <coughs> excuse me, to the Alliance for Healthier Generations, and it provides a calculator where you can enter information about what food item you might want to bring in, and then you'll be able to see if it um, meets the USDA's smart snacks in schools, nutrition standards. So I'm just gonna click on it so you can see how simple it is to use. Just read the directions, and then you can say what your product is. So I'm going to... Um, Say that we're going to bring in a snack and I'm going to say that it's not any of those above and it is a combination of a quarter cup of fruit and or vegetables you can say true or false I'll say false <laughs> and then you can enter the brand and the product. I did it earlier with Nabisco cookies, and they are not <laughs> acceptable. <laughs> so that um, sums up our policy recommendations for you. Um, and if you have any questions or any thoughts that you'd like for me to take back to the committee, um, I'd like to entertain those. Uh, can I, uh, you mentioned that this was a safety issue. Yes. And and we are seeing more students reporting with specific food allergies. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that? <coughs> yes. Um, the, in fact, I, the CDC says that in the past 10 years that allergies have increased 18% um, and that there are approximately anywhere between 4 to 6% of students across the country, so that would be also in our school district, that have food allergies. And we do have students with significant food allergies in our schools. Okay, thank you. So it seems like it's a, a lot of it was clarification and, and strengthening the, the existing policy. So um, yes. thank you for that, that work. I mean, this is something that we do with these policies like every five years, and so we were due for a review. Yes. Um, this, this year for this policy, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you want to ask your question? Because you asked me the question. I can't remember. All right, I, I would ask it. Okay. it are, I guess let me take a stab at it and then. Are we limiting what an individual parent can send with their child for their snack? We are, the policy would say that um, anything that would come in would need to meet those guidelines. So yes, we would be limiting. They, the one sweet treat per occasion is it would not be a part of the policy any longer. Okay, but th but that's for I think parties, right? Or is this everyday snack? The, well, the everyday snacks now would we be limiting that? Yeah. They they should meet the guidelines. Okay. But they should meet the guidelines now. But that's also not policed. Okay. So it's not pleased now. For the snacks. For the snacks for an individual child to have their snack. Mid 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 afternoon, yes. 
So the change that I saw indicated that. Uh, The teacher will assess if and when to offer snacks, but that's that's on a more of a special way. occasion, okay. not the daily snack that parents send with kids. Got it. Okay. And and on the issue of removing the one sweet treat, which we implemented a couple of years ago, is that is that continuing to present a problem in the classrooms? Is that why it's being? It is my understanding from the administrators that were on our committee that yes, that's continuing to be a problem. Thank you. So we're going to move to public comment. Yes, we are. Okay. Are there any other? No. Do you need this? No. No. Thank you. Uh, we are now at the uh, portion of our agenda where we uh, open the podium for public comment. If you would please um, step to the podium, state your name and address, and uh, please. There are a lot of folks I think here tonight who'd like to comment. If you would please. Limit your comments to three to five minutes. Uh, and direct them. Uh, because there are so many people, would you like me to keep three minute clock just as a just as a courtesy? As a courtesy. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Go ahead. My name is Sylvia Mazur and I'm with Jason Street. And last Wednesday, Granville High School and Middle School students organized an anti screening for the Cash National School Walkout, which was a national movement to end school violence. Students left their classroom and walked outside for 17 minutes as a call to action for legislative and social reform. I was involved in the production of the walkout, and I am proud to say the walkout allowed many students to recognize the importance of civic participation and motivation to actively start seeking the changes they wish to see. We were able to collect over 60 voter registration forms and 50 personal letters addressed to U.S. senators. The event cultivated an atmosphere, an atmosphere of support, which I believe empowered students to have the conviction and confidence to speak out for what they believe in. We are proud to be part of a school community of such mutual respect, affirmation, and encouragement of student involved initiative. This walkout was a way to unite students to make a change. This is a nonpartisan issue. This is us, the students of America, wanting to come to school every day and not be scared for our lives. Anyone else? Um, my name is Christine Jr. with 681 West Broadway. Um, I'm actually a teacher at the elementary school, and I just had a question um, actually to address about the wellness committee. Um, I guess I, my question was what teachers were on the committee? Um, as a teacher, I don't understand how we are expected, why we're teaching the standards, how we're supposed to police the snacks that are brought into our classrooms every day. And if I'm supposed to be teaching reading, how I'm supposed to be taking snacks away from kids if it doesn't meet our wellness policy. My problem with that is my kids don't eat lunch till 1230 every day. If it's my job then to take away their snack, so I'm supposed to say now you don't have anything to eat because I'm not providing the snack for them. So. If we're taking the one sweet treat away um, from the parties for the three parties that we have a year, I'm just wondering why three treats a year has to be restricted when, as a parent, I know what my child eats every day. Um, the parties are planned well in advance. It can be notified to all parents when I have kids that have allergies. Um, those parents have sent in other treats so that all students, their needs are always met. Um, it just seems like now we're taking everything away and as a teacher it's now my job to also monitor what these students are eating which that's not my job so um i just feel that as a teacher our opinions are not heard ever and this is just another instance of that thank you i can have mrs sherburn submit the names to Ms. jude mm -hmm. um, that were on the committee thank you Uh, my name is Julio Valenzuela, uh, 1359 Washoe Road. Uh, three children in the school district currently, one graduated, the fourth one graduated last year. Uh, my question has to do with uh, school safety. You know, there's uh, next to the uh, 
the, the plan that uh, the school committee has. However, um, noticing that a lot of the local schools would be other county one uh, school districts are implementing uh, stronger security measure, measures for active shooter situations, such as armed, armed personnel and uh, more of an uh, enhanced perimeter for the classroom. And I'm wondering if that is something that the safety committee is evaluating as well. And, and as well, the, the other um, things that should be evaluated are some of the failures that went on in Parkland uh, with the uh, permitting the sheriff's department and some of the, uh, the lack of response at that point. I'm not sure if the school is in communication with the local law enforcement agencies to ensure things like that do not happen. Also, any signs that there, and any, anything we have learned from the park lane situation that we may be able to apply uh, to our safety, uh, our safety plan here for Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? <laughs> on some of those topics, Dennis Fisher on 327 East Broadway, choosing a replacement school board member, um, even by consensus in executive session for affirmation at a later meeting, is a clear and unambiguous violation of Ohio Open Meetings Act. Um, those decisions and discussions are required by law to be made in public sessions and to be recorded in minutes. Um, that for someone not at the meeting can be read so people can understand the reasoning and the rationale behind the decision. I mean, I had no view on who you selected. I didn't know who was up for it. But um, it's a clear open meeting violation. It should have been done in public session. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to address you this evening. Um, lost my concentration after the uh, snack list there. <laughs> um, I, uh, I, I've expressed my uh, I'm Frank, I'm sorry, Frank Foster. Thank sorry you. about that. Uh, I, uh, I go off the concentration again. I'm snack, back to the snack <laughs> thing. Um, I, I, I've expressed my concern to uh, Superintendent Brown and board members uh, regarding the uh, scheduled walkout. Uh, I do want to commend uh, the, the superintendent that is responsible for uh, keeping the kids safe during that whole thing. I think he did a nice job of the whole bus thing around there. And, um, I can't analyze it much better than that, but it appeared to be uh, well thought out from that perspective. Um, and I don't disagree with any of these fine uh, students that are here tonight expressing their opinion. I, I appreciate the fact that they are uh, doing that and uh, commend you for it. My my position is related to the school's position on allowing these things to take place. Those things that are uh, at least uh, perhaps not on the surface, because there, there's certainly no one who's against uh, school violence. I can't imagine anyone in their right mind being against school violence, except there's acceptance of the uh, shooters themselves, perhaps. Uh, but the underlying political overtones of the whole thing, which I think uh, my, my statement is based upon the fact that, uh, as I understand it at least, there was along the lines of maybe 20 to 25 percent participation level. It kind of speaks to the fact that it is a divisive issue and politically oriented. My request of the board would be that you consider not allowing these things to ever take place again for fear of a group with less than good alternatives, or motives rather, that would uh, find a way to promote their own cause, or one of which none of us would necessarily agree with, or, or very few of us. Therein lies my concern, and also um, the fact that a small group of people who wanted a certain thing to take place in the middle of an educational session interrupted that educational session of the other kids who chose not to be there. I, I realize it's over. At this point, I'm not. I'm not uh, here to, to debate that portion of it, but only ask that that be considered uh, uh, a policy. Be considered to address those things in the future. Thank you. Thank you.
Hi, I'm a teacher, so I'm going to use my teacher voice. I don't need the mic. Uh, my name is Mitch Lerner. I live like there. Um, you can pretty much hear my house from the baseball. Uh, I want to address <coughs> the same topic, and I want to commend the administration at this school for the way that they handled the walkout. Um, and I do so for a couple different reasons. First, I, I acknowledge there's not a lot of options with regard to what you could have done. The Supreme Court in 1969, the Tinker case was quite clear. Students do not check their First Amendment rights at the door. Um, and unless their political speech is somehow fundamentally disrupted, which in this case it was not, there's not much the school can do about it. And I applaud you for, for recognizing that. Um, beyond that, though, on a more positive level, I, I've got two larger issues. One is that, and I'm an educator, I think anyone who works in education can tell you that the best way to ensure a high quality education isn't to quantify it in terms of number of minutes that students set, spend sitting at a, a textbook or listening to a teacher lecture. Part of it is creating a conducive learning atmosphere. And that kind of atmosphere is created when students feel engaged and welcome, as if their opinions matter, and they're not part of just a, a process of rote memorization. The day that there was the walkout, I would note, one of my son's classes had, uh, they called it pennies for, uh, well, pay patient, pennies for patients. It's a charity drive, and because the students had raised enough money, they didn't really do anything in class that day. Um, and that's fine, and these things go on sometimes. And while it's easy to kind of poke fun at that and complain about it, the bottom line is it creates a long-term environment where the students want to come to school, where they feel welcome, where they're excited about what's going on. Uh, and I think the results of Granville speak for themselves with regard to the success that we've had. The biggest issue, though, is the question of what it means to get a, an education. Um, there's a lot of reasons why we get a high school education, and there's a lot of things we expect from you as teachers. We expect our kids to learn to read and write. We expect them to be trained for, for a job or to go on to college. But more than anything else, I think the purpose of a high school education is to prepare the next generation to deal with the problems that they inherit. Um, when a group of students sees a problem, and whether we adults agree or not, this generation sees this as perhaps the defining issue of their day, when they come together to make a political statement and they do it on a nonpartisan way that is not disruptive to the education system um, and is thoughtful and quick and efficient, um, I think not only is there nothing wrong with that, I think they should be applauded for it, and, and you as an administration should be applauded for encouraging it. So thank you, and thank you to all the students who put it together. My voice isn't quite so loud, so I'm not <laughs> My name is Nick Maxwell, 144 Fairfax Court. I am a VHS senior and was one of the students who helped organize the walkout. Um, there's been a lot of conversation around this, both in personal conversations I've had on Facebook, on several different pages. Um, I'd like to address some of the specific issues that were mentioned here today and also in, in previous times. Um, Granville's motto is learning for life. And much like the previous speaker just referenced, learning civic engagement and learning how to effectively and with respect participate in the democratic process is something that's really, really essential. And for a lot of students that participated in this event, this was one of the first sort of forays into a way that they can channel their opinion and to be a part of a larger collective voice. So it was something that I thought was really, really powerful and really, really important for sort of a lifelong education. Um, we made sure very hard in all of our discussions with the administration. Let's see, I like, really would like to thank the administration, Mr. Brown, Mr. Gers, everyone that worked with us on this to address all of our concerns, us working to also help maybe change our position to help address some of so in the end we did come to a nice consensus with everything. Students that did not want to participate were not in any way affected by this. They were not forced to leave the classroom. Teachers were not forced to fundamentally change what they were doing. Any students that did miss class time made up the work later. It did not in any way impact the learning environments of the school. And I think the biggest takeaway from this was that in all of the organization, we really did try, and I think we succeeded in making sure this message was presented in a nonpartisan way. And what I mean by that is this was pure and simple a call to action by our generation, by students. This wasn't a call for a specific call for political policy. Unlike what a lot of people seem to think, this wasn't some sort of bashing of the second amendment or of the NRA. This was simply students saying that this is a problem that you can't tolerate any longer and that we need people to start doing something about it. And so I think that it was really important that we were able to express that and that it would be really long to say in a school environment that you aren't allowed to express that fundamental concern that really affects more than anyone else that's being in school. They may not have created this problem, but at the end of the day, we are the generation that grew up and is participating in these school shooting drills. This is a reality that we live every single day. 
and we finally decided that we need to say something. I think that's something that's really, really important and it's like really essential. Thank you. Hello, my name is Brett Black, 2579 Pleasant Crest Court. Um, I've got a couple of um, requests for public information for you guys. Um, it's got my contact information. Send it to me. Thank you. I decided to come in today because, um, unlike a couple of speakers here today, which everybody's obviously entitled their opinion, um, I disagree. I, I feel like the administration uh, has allowed um, two things that I disagree with in, in the school walkout. Um, number one would be a direct violation of their own rules that they, they themselves have set uh, be, be um, attendance. So, allowing students to dictate to them how it would happen while I recognize and appreciate and applaud your your uh, intent of keeping our kids safe. Um, I just think that uh, setting a precedent of uh, allowing students to circumvent the rules uh, by simply saying that they're going to do so is, is a bad precedent to set. Also, I think that uh, politics was allowed into our school system. The reason I say that is because the group that nationally organized this march uh, is a political organization with clearly stated goals. Um, two of which, one of one of which would be um, gun control advocacy, which some of us here would disagree with. Um, the second one would be one of their stated goals would be to object to any or any policy that would support Hardening of our schools for security purposes for our kids, which I wholeheartedly disagree with. Um, really appreciate the security overview you guys did. Um, I do have some questions there. One of the requests for public information was related to the security um, protocols that, that you have in place. Um, so I really appreciate that. And um, how long does it typically take to get responses and uh, documentation? It just depends on the on the amount of work it takes to put it together. Yeah. Okay. We need to make sure that that is the um, Yeah, and the one and last thing I just wanted to say is I, I feel strongly that it is um, our school's responsibility to observe neutrality in these situations. And while I definitely recognize that uh, all students, all Americans, should be able to voice their opinions politically, I think that it's inappropriate to do so during school hours. Um, I think you know it, it would be more advisable to do that on your own time after school. Um, and uh, I just just want to say I enjoy <coughs> schools. I have three kids that currently attend schools. One that graduated here in 2015, and uh, I just want to make sure that uh, you know, things are consistent across the board and that our schools remain neutral, so that. Uh, Values can be taught at home and not pushed in, school, in our school system. Thank you. Brett, I just want to make one clarification. Sure. Um, I haven't read your request, but the, some of the security plan documentation is not subject to open records requests. So we'll, we'll do whatever we can that's been publicly released, but I just wanted to clarify that. And I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that yeah. because obviously, as uh, parents, we like to see certain things. Um, you know, certain um, procedures sure. uh, exercised uh, in a way of surprise. So, <coughs> any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. My name is Jane Ludwig, and I'm with Kelly Weisberg. I am a, an educator, a great teacher, and a parent of two students. Uh, current college student that went to uh, 12 years at Granville, and my son is a junior. Uh, I wanted to um, talk about two things. The platform that these students chose was, in my mind, appropriate. They go to this school at least 40 hours a week. This is like their second home. As a teacher, I feel like a second parent to many of these children, all of these children that I have taught. When your home is threatened, how do you respond? They are speaking up for their rights to feel safe in their second home. And the platform chosen, I believe, was appropriate. 
I'm with them. I back them on this. Um, the second thing um, that I wanted to say was that many of these schools, and I know that my son informed me of this at dinner on Monday night, um, before the uh, actual walkout took place, that these students, and he was angry. He wanted to be punished for this. He wanted to walk out. He planned to walk out. He loves school. He is a top-notch student. He loves his classes. Mr. Fisher, who was here previously, is his favorite teacher, one of his favorites. He doesn't even want to miss a minute. Tomorrow he's going to take the ACT. They're allowed to go home afterwards. He said, Mom, I'm not going home. I don't want to miss physics. I'm going to stay with physics. Mr. McDonald's got something great going on. I'm like, pray for him, but what's this deal about you want to be punished? That doesn't even make sense. No, because I feel strongly about this. This is important enough to me that I'm going to walk out of a school that I love, that I love my classes. I don't want to walk out of school. I don't want to skip school. I feel that the students, um, he said we went to administration that were willing to take that time off of being tardy, as not being present. And I'm pretty sure after uh, my daughter's college, um, Vassar College in New York, has um, posted also to students that walked out that they are willing to forgive um, any penalties against students, high school students that walked out because they were willing to speak up for something that was important. And so I know that certain, I don't know all colleges did that, but I know certain colleges said, we back you on this. School violence is an important thing uh, to be concerned about, and so you should not be weary of any penalties from us. So that's, I just wanted to clarify those two things, but I do feel like the platform was appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jennifer Valenzuela, 1359 Mall Shows, Randall. Um, I'd be all for a walkout, honestly, if it did any good. Um, I want to know what good it's going to do. It was politically motivated, and that's just a fact. I'm concerned every day when I drop my kids off to school. I drop a fourth grader off, my son's a sophomore, and another son who's a seventh grader, and my daughter graduated last year. And now she's at a university that is clearly unsafe as well. I want to know that my kids are going to come home and I'm not going to get a dreadful call or an alarm on my phone that says there's been a school shooting. Our airports are safe. Our government buildings are safe. Why aren't our schools safe? There's so much that could be done. And if we're going to do a walkout, that's fine. Let's do a walkout, but let's have a result from it. What is the result? That's what I want to know. If we're going to do all of this time, all of this effort, uh, Superintendent Brown, you're going to field all these phone calls from concerned parents, then it has to be for a reason. There has to be a tangible reason for this. I am demanding, as a taxpayer of this community, of somebody who sends my children to school every day, and I know that there's good teachers in the school. My kids have all had good teachers. I'm proud of the fact that I have moved my family out to this community. My husband and I work really, really hard to live here, but I want our schools to be safe. That is my concern. Politics does not need to play a part at all. Just keep our kids safe. Thank you. Adrian Polimathia. I live at 420 North Pearl Street. Um, I'm going back a few pieces here. I just brought up that the school is violating it, um, or is allowing the violation of its own rules and attendance. Um, and I would just like to say that the, the school, there, the, the school not really field trips and stuff like that, which is also by that logic a, a in violation of those rules, but. It, this is an experience, um, it's like a learning experience that cannot be accomplished in the traditional classroom setting. And this walkout is also a learning experience that cannot be accomplished in the traditional classroom setting. So I don't see how letting students go out for a walkout, it's not that much different from letting students go out for a field trip which is also a learning experience. So that's just the, the main thing I want to add. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> Hi. 
My name is Julia Lerner. I'm an alumnus from Grandma High School. I graduated in 2015. <coughs> um, I would like, I live in Washington, D.C. now. I go to the University of Maryland. Part of what I do as a journalism major every day is cover political protests that happen on the street in Washington. And I'm so proud of all of the students that I've seen walk out. I'm really proud that my high school itself has students organizing this walk out. But I'd like to say, I don't think that students dying, I don't think children dying is a partisan issue. There should be no reason that I'm afraid to send my brother to high school. You don't see anything happening from it, you're not looking carefully then. You need to see that these students are rising up and saying that we are not going to let this happen again. Thank you. Uh, hi there, my name is Nick Mensker. I'm, I'm a senior at Granville High School and I'm one of the organizers of the walkout on the 14th. And I want to sincerely thank all of you who came here uh, for discussion and debate and voice your opinions and who have been doing so on Facebook and other channels for the past uh, several weeks since the Parkland shooting. Um, it's really important that communities in America have these discussions because this is how we keep it on the forefront of our minds and how we continue working to solve these issues. Um, so I think that it's important to state that every student in K-12 who's under 18 today has never lived in a world before the Columbine shooting. Today we live in a country where school violence on a mass scale occurs on a regular basis, stays in the news for maybe five days, and then becomes a district member. As a student, this cycle is terrifying. The survivors of the recent Florida Parkland shooting feel similar. Um, they've been an inspiration to students and adults and myself uh, as they've refused to let their lost peers be forgotten. I'm very proud to help them to organize a walkout that remembers the Parkland victims and help students to have a voice by registering voters. Um, by the way, we've registered 60 voters and uh, sent around 50 letters to legislators. Um, so this is kind of a tangible <coughs> thing that we've done that's come out of our walkout. Um, I want America to work together to quell this epidemic, and I think that's what the students want by coming together on a national scale on March 14th. Um, we dominated the front page news, and I think that the tangible goal we want to accomplish is pressuring legislators into doing something to save our lives. They haven't uh, at Columbine, they haven't at Newtown, um, but they will at Parkland, or else there will only be another one. Thank you. Thank you. Jake May, 2584 Upland View Court, and I just want to say that the high school students at Granville are amazing. You said organize, and I don't think you're wearing elephants and donkeys. I think you're standing up for your own rights. My daughter was the same age as the kids that were shot and killed in San Diego. And I just remember watching that and just crying for weeks. And here we are now, she's a sixth grader at the intermediate school. And we're more worried about people's rights than our kids being carried out of school in body bags. We're more worried about giving our teachers guns and giving them paper and books and tools to teach our kids with. So I commend all these kids. I think you all are amazing. You're standing up and you're demanding that change happens. You know, we have the dog that gets put in an overhead bin. My husband's a pilot. I don't know why that happened. We haven't talked about it yet. They put a puppy in an overhead bin and it dies. So immediately, somebody puts forth legislation. We're having 26 teachers and kids gunned down in Sandy Hook. Now 17 in question, where's our legislation? You know, I don't know what the answer is. I don't know if we want metal detectors. Do we want our kids, you know, going to school in a prison? I don't know what the answer is, but they make the big bucks and they need to figure it out. But I'm telling you guys, and I hope to see you on Saturday. Thank you. Um, I'd like to address the assertion that students should be forbidden or sheltered from devices issues such as this. Um, 
because this is just completely unrealistic and detrimental for real real world application of education taught these schools, for example, like in government class about processes and filters about participation in democracy. Um, and then to address concerns about the work of the walkout, uh, this was a very positive step for conversation regarding um, what changes students would like to see and how, how they want to accomplish it. Because these conversations that were generated, uh, I've noticed have continued far past the day of the walkout, uh, for example. And then also just the fact that many students were able to register to vote and contact their representatives is an, is an example of students taking an active role in the participation in their government, which in my opinion is a lot of work. Um, to conclude, I'd like to read an excerpt from the United Nations uh, Human Rights Treaty called the United Nations Convention on the Right of the Child, a treaty that the U.S. signed in 1995. The Convention on the Rights of the Child recognizes that children are not merely passive recipients entitled to adult care. Rather, they are the subjects of, of rights. Governments are obliged to fulfill, protect, and respect the right of children to assert their views as individuals and as constituents in all manners that, that concern to them and have to have them taken seriously. The Committee on the Rights of the Child has stressed the right to participate, that the right to participate applies to all children who can form views, however young, and it applies to all areas of their lives, from the family, school, local community, and public services. Participation is thus a fundamental right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, I'm uh, Kieran Sullivan. Valley Court, technically not Granville Park Trails, but in the township, so it's fine. Um, <laughs> I'm a senior at a Granville High School, and you know, I just wanted to come up here. I wanted to commend a lot of the actions that were taking place, of course, in the walkout. Um, the moment I turned 18, I um, went online and I tried to submit my voter's registration form so that I could actually participate in the fall 20, 2017 election. Unfortunately, uh, Due to some complications, they never got my uh, they never got my form, and I was relatively put down, and that just put a general uh, a general sense of disinterest and distrust in a lot of uh, I guess of, of what the bureaucracy necessarily stands for. Now, so with the, with the walkout and the way that was conveyed, I felt that I, as a student, was actively able to you know, as I've stated previously, stand up for something that I you know would believe in and. It's a rightful cause. Don't want to see kids get killed. Um, and I thought that the way that it was conveyed was in a nonpartisan way. The voter registration forms that um, they were able to collect, they were um, con they were put in they were put in locations like the uh, lunchroom and the study hall room, and they were out of the way. If you were interested, you could go up and you could fill out the form yourself, and also a letter. It was not, you did not have to actively walk out to get this form, and if you did if you did not do that, but you were still interested in registering the vote, you can still do that, and I commend them for that. My sister didn't go on the walkout because she was working on homework, but she's able to vote, so that was fine. And then, um, I thought that the grand vote, I thought that, uh, from what I've heard, at least the discussions at the, uh, school board had with the students that actually you know worked it out was done in a uh, rightful manner. You know, it really helps to not convey the sense that this is a you know some sort of bizarre authoritarian government. You know, we're not they're not oppressing students for what they believe in. This isn't Tiananmen Square. That's good. Um, now and then also with the. Uh, with the idea that the protest doesn't inherently bring out like direct results and you know i mean rightfully so people want to have answers to well, want something to be done um the inherent purpose of a protest is that it is a much more you know slightly indirect uh way of bringing about change you know the students who um students who participated in you know the 1969 teacher case with the uh, armed bands they didn't expect that their 
calls would be heard directly like a year after concerning the Vietnam War. And they knew that and they took it for the long run and eventually some change was made. And with the way that was done, I think that could probably happen. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else who would like to speak? I'm Vidanda Lele, uh, 113 Shaken Place. Is this on? Yes. Yeah. All right, good. Um, just a couple of quick things. Uh, I want to thank the board for recognizing uh, something that the students have been recognized early on. You know, it's interesting, most of the students here are in their political minority. That is, they don't have a franchise, they're not in their political majority the way I and some other people might be. So they're not really political actors the way that I and other people might be. And so curiously, the, the kind of civic action that they engage in, this is the kind of civic action that they're able to engage in. And so it's, it's sort of ironic. Um, I know some have said that this was a decidedly sort of political uh, affair, political demonstration, but curiously, they're not necessarily political actors, but again, the way that I am. Um, and the issue, as far as I know, hasn't been raised the level of federal uh, political policy yet, or public policy yet. So curiously, uh, when those say, um, you know, it was, a, it was a political event, um, ironic, sometimes irony is funny, sometimes it's sad and pathetic, in this case it's the latter. Um, but uh, curiously, the issue is actually not political. And I think the students are drawing attention to the fact that that's the problem. Right? And so that's, that's the first thing I would, I would remind people. And then the second thing, actually the two other things I'll be as quick as I can, is that um, they were doing it as students in school. Right. So this was not an extraneous sort of external affair. Um, the violence they were sort of drawing attention to grimly, so the grim reality is that that violence has become part of their curriculum. And so actually, you know, I know some have said that this should be dealt with sort of ex externally, extramurally, uh, extracurricularly. But it's part of the curriculum. And so it had to be done by students in school because they were addressing an issue that was directly tethered to the conditions of them being students in school. So while some might think that there's a sort of a slippery slope towards other things, this issue was about the very conditions, the conditions of possibility for them to be students in school. And so it made sense, actually, that there were students in school addressing, again, an issue that makes it possible or makes it not possible for them to be students in school. I just want to sort of lay that logic there because it's pretty intact, right? And then the third thing I just want to say is I want to thank Mr. Durst and Mr. Brown uh, for engaging with the students the way they did. You know, um, I was among those initially who thought that there should have been some sort of consequence, some penalty. That is, uh, you know, students walk out of class and there's a sort of a rule that is violated. There should be some sort of consequence that sort of flows effortlessly, right? Um, that's, that's what I initially thought, um, but they took a much more difficult task, that is they took seriously the pedagogical and educational responsibility that they had to students. That is every encounter, every engagement with the student is an opportunity for students to learn. I'm a professor, and I don't do that all the time, I'm embarrassed to say. And so I actually learned something from this process. They could have done something very easy, that is applied axiomatically, a rule, a consequence, right? But they did something more difficult, right? Um, applying the rule axiomatically is comforting because it's quick, it's efficient, but like deductive reasoning, you learn nothing from it, right? From deductive logic, you actually learn nothing new. But they took the more difficult task of making the students think, making them defend a position with empirical facts, and making them argue for something. Right? That's much more difficult, but it's actually more pedagogically responsible because the students grew and they learn. And that really is their obligation. So I want to thank Mr. Brown, I want to thank Mr. Church for requiring, forcing the students to think in ways that wouldn't be possible otherwise had a rule system axiomatically applied. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak during public comment? <clears throat> Last chance. Okay. Uh, we will then close public comment, uh, which takes us to the uh, next portion of the board meeting, which is a board discussion uh, where the board typically engages in um, an open discussion on issues before the board. One of the things that we had identified tonight uh, is the safety discussion. It's not limited to the safety discussion, but um, I will open it up to the board uh, for discussion for anyone who has uh, comments or uh, want to address any of the issues. Um, first, I'd just like to thank Tanya for the, the report on, on the school safety. It was um, um, 
been a little while since we've sort of really understood in it everything that's entailed in our safety plan. And, you know, for those who don't know, I mean, the plan is, you know, hundreds of pages long. So it's, it's, it's quite the endeavor. And so we do take our role um, in keeping our students safe um, very seriously. Um, um, in terms of, um, I, I think we need to talk about, there's been a lot of discussion here and um, about the walkout, so I think we need to take some time to, to talk about that. Um, I um, um, thank everybody for coming and um, expressing your opinions very, um, what I'm looking for, um, congenially, and we, I think we had a lot of um, um, positions um, stated. Um, thanks to the students for coming and um, really describing what it meant to you to do this. Um, I'm going to just say I, I support your efforts. I think it was important that it happened during the school day um, for the reason the gentleman, the last gentleman just said. Um, it, this is directly related to their, their beings and their existence as a student. And so I sort of felt like it, you know, it, it, and as, as uh, Mrs. Ludwig said, it was the appropriate um, platform for uh, this to happen in. So um, I'm going to just throw those two cents out there. Um, but I do thank everybody for coming and listening. And um, um, public discussions like this, I think, are important for us to come up with resolutions for um, something that is really very important, the safety of our students in schools. Um, it, it's not something that I think our students should ever have to really deal with, um, but they do, and it's sad and it's scary. Um, and again, and some of the outcomes clearly are we're still talking about it, so that's an outcome. Students are ready to vote, so that's an outcome. Um, they've written to legislators to keep this movement going, so that's an outcome. So I do feel like this effort of theirs has had direct um, result has, has resulted in. Um, Lots of um, positive things moving the issue forward. Just to comment on a few of the things that came up this evening. I would also like to, uh, Mr. Valenzuela mentioned, um, you know, some of the things that other school districts are doing. Um, April 4th, our safety committee is getting together to talk about a variety of different topics. So I just wanted to, you know, let him know that that was going to take place. All of our first responders are a part of that committee. Um, we have a couple of national experts that live in Granville that are part of that committee. Um, so a lot of topics will be discussed and shared and kicked around uh, like they always are um, based on the latest and greatest information about school safety. So I just wanted to highlight that for him. I'm glad you brought that up. I, I think we'd probably like to have a report back to us after that April 4th meeting or next board meeting. Clearly, there's different context for, for that discussion. So, um, if we can put that on the agenda and make sure we have a report in April, for sure. Okay. Yep. Um, I'll say that kind of one thing that I've kind of been enlightened to as a board member, you see a little bit more communications, you hear kind of a bit more behind the scenes, is like the, the extreme. Um, emphasis that we have on safety and Jeff I know that's like a huge priority to you and I, I can feel that yeah. you know in all of your decisions and as a primary a primary guiding force for our organization and I really thank you for that um, another you know important thing that you brought to us also is the mentality of continuous improvement though right and you know school safety is absolutely a top priority but i think we always need to revisit all of our policies as we do on a regular basis and think about what's next and, and i don't have any preconceived notion about the right next steps to take in the context of what's happened recently or in the context of our community but i'm really encouraged that we have um, again fantastic community partnerships and we have mechanisms in place with our safety committee and you know like you said russ i'm looking forward to hearing that update and i'm i'm open to whatever suggestions are the best practices that we can bring in from other places and the things that we can draw up in our community so i i feel great sending my kids to school every day um but i know that's not just something that you do once it's something you continue to revisit and i think in the context of our community we're looking forward to supporting the best recommendations we can going forward Welcome to your first meeting. <laughs>
Yeah, yeah. Oh, I don't. <laughs> you, you did this before me. So. Um, with respect to Mr. Kushan's objection to our selection and our process, um, we had several special meetings scheduled. At the end of our most recent special meeting, we actually did come out of executive session and have a public discussion. And that's when we made the candidate selection. So it was not in violation of Sunshine Law. Um, yeah. Pardon? We recorded it. Could we mention also the background that we did to ensure that our process was appropriate? I was not partly directly involved with that, but we did quite a bit of research in the process of understanding how best to select a board member that included, you know, reviewing with the Ohio School Boards Association and other organizations to ensure that we had the best process. And I would say that we didn't feel that, you know, brief, few minute long public presentations or interviews were the most appropriate because this was a decision we took very significantly. And we wanted the extended time with each one of the candidates and, and time to deliberate amongst ourselves to make sure that we uh, did the best. And it was a difficult decision, but I think the process that we followed was was one that I'm proud of and the outcome as well. I share that. I'm very comfortable with what we did. Okay. Um, thank you, all of you. Uh, and I should have said this earlier before some of the uh, folks here left. Uh, it, it takes some effort, it takes some conviction, it takes some uh, risk to get up in public forums like this and state a position no matter what the position is. Uh, and one thing that, that I think we all know on this board is that we have a community that cares. Mm -hmm. uh, a community that takes very seriously what we all view as our obligation to provide a safe and outstanding learning environment for our children. That's why we live here, every single one of us. So thank you all for expressing your opinion. And I'm, you know, I'm especially gratified that there are a number of students here who can observe and participate firsthand in a process where people can express their opinions without attacking each other, mm -hmm. unlike what we see on television, on commercials, on the news coming out of Washington, D.C. So I commend each and every one of you for the respect that you show, for the thoughtfulness that you show, for the consideration that you show. Uh, to me, that's one of the great uh, benefits that comes out of a discussion like this. Uh, and I think we have to keep talking to each other, not at each other, because this is a complex <coughs> issue that, that uh, has been found in our, our country for a while now. Going back, certainly before then, but you know, 1999 was Columbine. Uh, we haven't had a, haven't come up with a solution for it yet, or the political will to find a solution for it yet. Uh, so I would encourage everyone to keep the conversation going. Let me speak first of all about our commitment to safety and then secondly, specifically about the walkout. Our commitment to safety is, um, is full and complete. And it's unwavering and the administration lives that every single day. They spend more time worrying about the safety of students and staff than anything else. Which if you think about it is double-edged sword. We'd like them to be able to spend more time thinking about the education of students. Um, they do a lot of that too, but the safety issue is, is primary. Uh, <coughs> there are a lot of things that we do within the district that uh, some of which uh, Ms. Sherburn spoke about tonight, others that we don't disclose. Um, we spend time, we spend money, we spend effort training, we spend um, opportunities working with law enforcement. We spend uh, time bringing in folks from outside the community and from inside the community on the safety committee. 
and there are things that we, we as a board will want that group to continue to look at. Um, whether it's increasing security in the buildings, uh, doors and windows, whether it's increasing cameras in the buildings, additional and um, perhaps more informed uh, training on after, active shooter situations, um, contemplating the presence of uh, security officer or service officer or Randall. PD officer in the building. Uh, I, I think that the board would, would say, and I don't intend to speak for everyone on this board, so folks may not agree with me, but I think what we want is for our safety committee to look at all those things and to consider all those things uh, and be, um, be willing to um, propose solutions. Um, I think more critically, and this is not just the safety committee's responsibility, it's, it's all of our responsibilities, and it's something we've been working on within the classroom, within the school buildings themselves. We have to look at the, the big underlying issue here, which is mental health. We have to really be better. Every one of us be better at you know, ferreting out issues of, um, of illness. Uh, that may be evident sometimes, may be less evident sometimes. Uh, may fester until there's a situation like they had in Parkland. Clearly, as Mr. Valenzuela pointed out, you know, we, we know from media reports, there seem to have been ample opportunities to intercede there, uh, and yet it didn't happen. It's imperative that we make sure that doesn't happen here, and communities around the country need to make sure the same thing. So we need to work on that. We have a uh, and this year that the board has um, sponsored this year on well-being, on wellness for students. Uh, and it is to consider everything that, that enters into that broad definition. But um, each one of us as parents, as members of the community, as staff, as students, needs to be sensitive to the, to the issues uh, that, that give rise to violence in school. And we have to we have to stop it. We have to be better at, at identifying threats before they become acted on. Um, we should think about <coughs> earlier screening for depression. The AMA came out came out recently and recommended that in twelve year olds. We should think about how we do that. We should consider whether there's a way to effectuate that. We need to improve our our training for staff and students, not just on active shooter drills, but on spotting problems in advance. We really have to focus on the underlying cause. Um, and, and the reason is, and we all know this, we could have an unlimited budget, we still can't hardly school enough. Um, there, is, uh, there is no way, frankly, to put a bubble around our schools, around our bus stops, our school buses, our children on the playing field, our children at recess, our children traveling through town. There's no way. If there were, we would have done it. And other districts would have done it too. So while we as a board, I think, have to continue to, to demand, uh, and you should demand of us, that we think of as many options as we can, to enhance student safety, we also all have to realize that, you know, that there are limitations to that. We, we need to stop the active shooter before he or she arrives on the school campus. We need to stop it before that person ever picks up a gun. And that's all of our obligations. Uh, I'm gonna speak for myself a little bit here on two issues. One. Um, on the walkout. Uh, I, I recognize that there you know, are different views on the walkout and what we should have done. I would dispute completely the view that as a school board, as a school administration, as a school body, that, that we caved in to anyone here. Uh, what the administration did is exactly what I think they should have done. In the face of 
a strong interest from students to gather and demand the need of school violence. And that's, make no mistake, that's exactly what that event was. The posters that were put up were eventually taken down at the direction of the administration. The posters were put up, admittedly, um, were printed, at least, it seems, by a, a group that had a political interest. The point of the whole event was made clear by the poster, which was a demand and end to school violence. That's not political. Politics means there's opposing views. I recognize here that there's no one in this room, there's no one in this community that has an opposing view to demanding an end to school violence. We may have different ways that we think that could be addressed. We may disagree about how that can be addressed. But there's no one that seriously contemplates an opposing view to an end to school violence. So I will reject the notion this was a political event. It was an exercise in free speech. Uh, I'm proud of the students for organizing. I'm proud of them for uh, their willingness to listen to the concerns of the administration uh, with respect to their safety, with respect to minimizing the disruption uh, in the school day. I thank them for that. I think that was quite responsible. Um, but I think they did what they should have done. Uh, I think they did what students back in 1963 did. Uh, children did in the Birmingham bus march. Uh, when they demanded an end to violence, racial violence. I think there have been examples throughout history uh, where people protested, where people stood up and made their views known. And that led to change. It doesn't lead to immediate change, unfortunately, but it leads to change. And so I'm, I'm thankful that it happened. I appreciate the work that went into it. Mr. Durst and the folks at the high school, Mr. Brown, the administration. It took a lot of time, it took a lot of thought, it took a lot of collaboration and effort in order to make this um, occur without disrupting a school day without putting them at risk. And the students, as I understand it, I wasn't there, conducted an event where everyone was welcome to get up and speak their piece, no matter what their political views might have been. So thank you for that. A couple of you commented about, well, what you did with that protest was significant. It was really significant. Now you have to vote. Um, there are different views, of course, on how we address the situation in this country, but ultimately it's going to be legislative action. Uh, and legislators pay attention to people who vote. And it's not about how much money you give, it's not about how many rallies you go to, it's whether you vote, and whether you vote every single time there's an election. So when you're old enough, register and vote, and be heard. There was a, uh, a comment about arming staff uh, in addition to hardening um, our campuses. And you've heard what I had to say about the hardening of the campuses. I think we will do everything we can, but I think we all must recognize the limitations of that. And I'm speaking for myself only because the board has not discussed this. And I would not be in favor of, of arming staff. Do not see it as a viable, safe way to address school shootings. The evidence uh, against Army staff is overwhelming. And we've prided ourselves on making decisions here based on data, based on hard data. If if arming more people was the was the way to stop shootings, we wouldn't have any shootings because we're the most well armed country in the world by multiples, significant multiples. So I don't think putting more guns um, in the schools is a solution. I'm concerned about how we would uh, then analyze and assess candidates for teaching spots. 
Do we start evaluating people based upon their, their marksmanship skills? Do we start retaining teachers who uh, may or may not be what we want based on their marksmanship skills? Do we ensure that teachers um, have the guns on their, on their persons at all times so that they're never left where someone else can get them? I'm also uh, convinced, and, and in full disclosure here, I've been a gun owner, gun owner much of my life. I grew up learning how to use guns. I grew up hunting for pheasant and quail, for ducks and deer. And I'm not afraid of guns, and I don't have guns. But we're not talking about those kind of guns here. We're talking about the kind of guns that, you know, that have one purpose, and it's to hunt humans and cause mass destruction. And an armed teacher with a handgun no matter how skilled, no matter how well intended, no matter how prepared that teacher is, is likely to be overmatched. There was an interesting statistic that I read um, just this last week. Um, the New York City Police Department has about 36,000 police officers. Highly trained, highly experienced, highly skilled. And the statistics there indicate that when an officer on duty discharges his or her gun, in New York, over the last period of time, and I can't tell you whether it's the last five years, ten years, or what, but it's a, reported to be a year ago. But they hit their target one third of the time. So imagine, if you will, a school shooting event where we're expecting a teacher who's not a professional law enforcement officer to step into a crowded hallway, identify who the shooter is, and, and discharge his or her weapon in order to neutralize the shooter. I don't think that's a solution. I don't think that's a meaningful solution or a reasonable solution at all. So I'm not in favor of arming teachers. I think we have to, um, we have to start getting to the root of the problems we've talked about on mental health issues. We have to start thinking about uh, how we balance as a community, as a country, how we balance the rights of individuals versus our right to send their kids to school and keep them safe. Um, I don't want to make this a debate about the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms. I'm happy to have that discussion if anybody would like. That's not what this is. This is about protecting these young people. This is about putting an end to the violence. The 17 lives lost at Parkland, 26 lives lost at Sandy Hook, 15 lives lost at Columbine, the three lives lost at Chardon uh, a few years ago. Does anybody here even remember that in January of this year, before Parkland, in January of this year, there was a school shooting in Kentucky, and two students were killed. That went way over. It just disappeared because it wasn't big enough, and then Parkland came along. And every time this happens, we say the same thing, go through the same ritual. We offer thoughts and prayers, we offer remembrances, we Say we need to do something about this. We say we shouldn't make it political. We say anything we want to say. And if you honest as parents, you do what I do, which is you give thanks every time that happens that it didn't happen in our community to our kids. But the one thing we know without question is if we keep doing what we're doing, if we don't make meaningful change, this will happen again and again and again. <clears throat> and every time it happens, that means somebody's prayer that it doesn't happen to their kid wasn't answered. That's not acceptable. That should never have been acceptable. These young people are telling us it is not acceptable and we're demanding to do something about it. I think it's incumbent upon us to figure that out. And so I applaud you for what you did. I thank you all for being here tonight. I thank you all for caring about what goes on in our schools and our kids.
So, with that, I think we will move into the, the reading of the uh, board policy. So, what I would do that that would be the end of our board discussion tonight. Um, unless you want to listen to the reading of the board policy, um, I, would, I would invite you. <laughs> Wait a minute, my wife's even in. Run now. <laughs> Run now. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so glad I joined you. Okay. <laughs> I know. Sorry, Jess. Thank you. Very nice. <laughs> Don't worry, it's going to be very. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Great job, dude. Thank you. Great job, States. Thank you. All right. So, um, I had a PowerPoint, but all it did was list the different policies. So I'm just going to read off the OSBA uh, PDQ, which is the uh, governing body that talks about board policy changes. So I'm just kind of kind of run through the list of things that are on that list that we must adjust to. Um, honestly, nothing is of significance. I say that <coughs> you know. Uh, and I'll say something significant. Uh, so the first couple we've actually addressed already. The first one is the um, business advisory councils where we have uh, signed a resolution with the Licking County ESC and the entire county for them to uh, host our business advisory council. The policy was just late coming because of the legislation being introduced uh, uh, late as well. Um, the, the next two items are emergency management and safety plans. Those new policies get implemented probably every six months as Homeland Security adjusts their practices. So we're just catching up to that. Um, Tanya kind of alluded to um, some of the changes that are coming, coming and those are referenced in the um, board policy update. Um, drug testing for uh, district personnel required to hold a CDL. A commercial driver's license. There was a, a tweak um, for follow-up testing um, on that policy, so uh, that is um, in place. The policy G, uh, JECAA, which is the admission of homeless students and the regulation that accompanies that, is also been revised a couple of different times in the last three years. Um, it's all based on the McKinsey Vinto Act. Uh, that governs how we respond to homeless children. Ryan Bernath is our homeless uh, student liaison. And uh, I have to tell you, if there's one thing that you know flies completely under the radar is when a student is deemed homeless, uh, the lengths that we take to keep them engaged in school. And, and Kim Cleary, uh, one of those obligations is to provide transportation. Um, Kim Cleary goes above and beyond to make sure that transportation is not a barrier to those, those students or parents. So I'd just like to throw that in as a kudos to her. Uh, and then um, student absences and excuses. Uh, with the implementation of House Bill 410, the defin definition of excused absence has been modified. Um, and so we're updating that language um, not only in this board policy, but then we'll do an adjustment to our handbook language in our next month's handbook. What's the change? It's all a definition of what is excused. It's just different language. Like it is the, the principles are the same. I mean, like the ideas yeah, the are the same. It's just changing correct. the language. Okay. Yes, exactly. If, if you want my analysis of it, mm -hmm. it expands it a little bit so that a definition of an excused absence is a little bit broader. Okay. Um, because now districts are getting challenged on their unexcused and excused absences in totality. I think what you'll see is 410 will be modified in the future just for unexcused absences. I hope that'll help us a little bit. I've had a lot of yeah. parents approach me with concerns specifically about <coughs> truancy and issues that they've received based on the communication they've had and so forth, right? With like honest concerns about the kids have been out sick a couple of days, are you really going to come and have a problem or something like that? So and maybe we, this will help. We are required by law to notify them after seven absences um, that they are, you know, 
on watch, so to speak. Uh, and we try and soft sell that letter, but you know, as a parent who received one myself, uh, <laughs> you know. Uh, well, because there are legitimate reasons why right. your kids are out, so it doesn't yeah. matter if it's. Yeah. And, yeah. and unfortunately, the law, law does not uh, delineate between excused and unexcused enough. Uh, and you know, when you have a student that potentially is at the James undergoing cancer treatment, and you know, we are providing education down there, they are still considered, uh, it's still considered an absence in the eyes of that law. And so those are the things that need to be tweaked. Um, and then the only other thing that I would reference that is on the list is our tobacco policies um, and school tobacco um, policies. We are actually one of three school districts in the state, <coughs> in, the, in Lincoln County, that has 100% passed the uh, Lincoln County Health Department's uh, zero tobacco on school property for staff and for students. Our, our policies have already passed, so these are almost moved. So that is it. Um, the only other thing that I would say is in the future with the um, student wellness update that was provided, uh, at some point a policy will be coming that aligns with some of the recommendations that you pushed. Any questions for me? No. No. Okay. Place cleared up, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I, heard, I heard you were going to get up there and say something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Even Mike. Yeah. 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 I guess they're not so interested in board policy. <laughs> <laughs> so board reports, uh, next, I'll, I'll kick it off. Uh, just briefly on the Economic Sustainability Initiative. As we've discussed in the past, the Economic Sustainability Ad Hoc Committee that is formed, the Village Council, the Township Trustees, the GRD, and uh, the school board hasn't met in a while. Uh, there have been sort of subsets of that group that have met first to deal with um, plans to try and address um, potential development down in South uh, Cherry Valley. Um, I think that group has finished its work. I don't think there's anything new coming there. Uh, there's an active um, group now uh, dealing with South Main Street and the um, replacement of the bridge on um, 37 the ODOT will start uh, next year. Uh, the widening of the bridge and what it means for traffic coming in to and out of Granville. Um, and as part of that, there are, there are some ongoing discussions about planning for future developments on, um, on the neighbor uh, in, in that immediate area. Um, it's, we're still talking about the bridge. We're not really talking about development yet, so I'll report back when we are. Uh, but but plans are in place for the infrastructure at least to support some movement. Thanks for being involved. Yeah. Um, so there's been a lot of activity going. I'm going to give a CTEC update. Um, I, I sit on the CTEC board okay. as our representative. Um, and uh, so there's been a lot of action going on with CTEC and what we're doing and collaborations and things like that. So I just wanted to sort of point out everything where it is and um, um, sort of give just an overall update. So we've, there's two initiatives that we've been working on with them. One is our IT pathway. Um, and students during scheduling were able to choose from web design, game design, programming, AP computer science principles, and computer and mobile apps. Um, and so those were all, the, so those were the courses that will be happening next year. Um, and then also the business um, pathway has been approved um, and students were able to choose from strategic entrepreneurship, marketing, business management, and personal finance management, which is the class that takes place of finan financial literacy. So those things are all in place and students will be able to take advantage of all of those opportunities next year. Um, I get the applications for interested business candidates were due last week and Granville and CTEC will be uh, collaborating on hiring that person. So it's, you know, I just felt like so much was going on, I just wanted to solidify um, where we are. Um, and then at our meeting last month, two Granville students from the IT um, program came and spoke to us. Mm -hmm. um, they were rather impressive, I have to say. It was um, Daniel Abdel-Samed and uh, Burke Abbott. 
Um, Daniel presented on an app that was used during the marching band's trip to the Outback Bowl, where they were able to um, post photos and updates and schedule changes, and only those people who um, subscribe to the service um, were able to use the app, but he's been since been approached to actually make that more widely available, um, so as a business opportunity. Um, and then Burke Abbott presented on a, um, a uh, website that he's doing for a local organization. Um, I can't remember which one, but it, <laughs> but um, but um, and so both of those things are happening in class and because of the, cl the computer classes that they're taking. Um, and then uh, Dr. Mullaney told me that both students are now meeting with the Licking County Chamber to discuss poten potential job opportunity to create an app for the young leaders of Licking County Group. So yeah. we got a lot those you know a lot of opportunities coming out of can they help come help me with <laughs> yeah. like turning on my phone yeah, <laughs> yeah so it's, you know it's kind of exciting like that this is you know they're doing great stuff so. every time i walk into ryan's classroom uh, daniel and burke are like come on over here i gotta show you what i'm working on i have no idea what they say yeah. because they're speaking a completely different language yeah. but it's super cool yeah and 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 really they're both entrepreneurs right now they That's are great. selling their service yeah. to community members that need it uh, some of them are nonprofit but some of them are for-profit entities yeah. that love what they're doing yeah. and I think that you know that other pathway where you talk about strategic entrepreneurialism and and social entrepreneurialism that is that's a significant benefit to our students mm -hmm. and um, Remember, that was a reallocation of a current program mm -hmm. um, that we thought would be um, better aligned with some of the things that our students say that they want to have experience in. Um, it's also giving us an opportunity to use the space that was previously used by um, FCS for more of our students that need functional living skills um, through MH units and other, other um, class opportunities. So we're, we're really maximizing both the space and the position um, to, I think, align with the best practices. I got to give Joyce, Stephanie, Ryan, Matt um, kudos on making this work. Yeah. Um, you know, because we have to, it's, there's a financial implication, but then there's also a logistical, educational um, aspect to these conversations. And they really go at it. For what's in the best interest of students and then how do we palette what has to happen you know in both of our budgets but they do a fantastic job um, Stephanie and and Joyce and CTEC as a whole is a gem Absolutely. so we're lucky to have them in our county it's, you know it's fairly unique I think um, partnering that's going on that yes I think that the state would like to see anyway, but I just think it's unique, you know, and we're doing yeah. what's best for our students. And yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. I wouldn't mind having um, Burke and um, Daniel come present here at some point. So. They, they will blow your mind. Yes, they will. So um, it would be worth um, having them. Now, Daniel will tell, tell you that we've kind of handcuffed him because he challenges our infrastructure <laughs> and our, our security. So I know will tell you, you know, just take the handcuffs off and look what I can do. Yeah, um, all the yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, uh, quick update on the Granville Education Foundation. Uh, it was a good meeting recently with the uh, impending change in leadership and that Wendy Patel, who served as president for the last few years, terms are expiring. And the group took that opportunity to have more of a strategic meeting instead of just an operational one. Really think more deeply and pose some questions about like, are they headed in the right direction? You know, are they thinking of the right projects? Are they, you know, fundraising in the right, right ways? And so I think it was a good chance for them to kind of step back from their operational things and think about that. Um, I've been very pleased with what they've done with the alumni and more. I think there's also a lot more potential capacity that they could help serve in some way. And I think that it's good that they're asking themselves the question, should they consider reorganizing? Should they consider going after Boulder projects? Should they consider going after more events and so forth? So it was a good meeting. Um, I'm going to mention, just run through the current list of, of trustees, because if any of you happen to see them out and about, it's been a while since I've mentioned those names. Be sure and thank them. There are also three current openings, which they will be accepting resumes for. So uh, Wendy Patel is uh, um, stepping out as the president. Amy Parsley White, Amy Sanders, Amy Del Reinhardt, uh, Brad Hislop, Christy uh, Charbot, Don Eggleston, Debbie Thomas, 
James Matamo, Janice LaRosso, Joe Johnson, Carla Shockley, Laura Romano, and Lee Heckman and Nate Wilson are all of the Afghan Tech trustees. So again, CM thanks them for their work. And uh, I was really excited they're really starting to think about this strategically instead of just the same old, and I'm not sure exactly where they'll end up, but hopefully it will be with some bolder opportunities for us. So. I agree. Well, they have our thanks and appreciate it. <clears throat> sure. Good Thank you. Um, move to the action agenda? Yes. Okay. Item 13.01, unpaid leave request. So moved. So moved. Second. Um, so notice the language is submitted in accordance with the collective bargaining agreement. This is something that is in the CBA that a teacher can request a leave of absence for up to a year. And, and I think this is granting the request would be inconsistent with what we've done in the past. That would be correct. For similar requests. Yes. Yeah. Can we explain why? Yeah, sure. yeah. So um, you, you will see later in the agenda, in the consent agenda, um, Megan's resignation. Um, so they are moving uh, to Texas. So um, she was hoping to have a, a year on paid leave. Um, so it's a relocation intended to be a permanent relocation. That is correct. Um, and in instances of the past when we've had <coughs> staff who, who have made permanent relocation, we have not moved. Correct. That instance. would require the district to hold their position for a year um, with, with no real commitment. Conversely, had staff members who have left to pursue academic opportunities or other opportunities with the intent of coming back after the year we have. Yes. That is not, accurate. Not that this intended to be a permanent relocation. Correct. So what's the point of requesting an unpaid leave if you don't have the intention of coming back? Can that be a rhetorical question? <laughs> 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 no. Um, I think it's a safety net. Okay. I just didn't understand why. I mean, if you know you're not coming back, why why right. you, why you request it, or why why is it in the I think sometimes people get nervous with with transitions <clears throat> and want a safety net. Okay. Doctor Corman. No. Mr. Miller. No. Ms. Dees. No. Mr. Wolf. No. Mr. James. No. Thank you. Just as new member. Uh, Just as new member. 1302, I don't want my name Licking County name. ESC uh, contract for 2018 and 2019. So, so second. Okay, um, the, this is our contract with the Licking County ESC for preschool, uh, which is the funding uh, fun flow agreement, preschool contract, and the special education related services contract. Um, what I'd like to do is just make sure, because we've had a couple of conversations about preschool recently. Um, the ESC is under new leadership, Dale Llewellyn. Um, Dale came in, he's been doing an analysis of their entire shop to see where we could um, trim cost. And um, the whole point of an ESC is to realize economy of scale and reduce cost for local districts. Um, he has agreed to lower that rate by 15% for next year. Um, with a commitment to continue to do that work of reducing cost. In the same breath, we are looking always for ways to bring those services either in-house or partner with another uh, agency that could do it more cost effectively. So, um, but when you're transitioning services like a preschool, it's usually an 18 month process. And um, and so it's not done, so, not something that can be done overnight. Uh, so we are, I, I am comfortable recommending that we approve these contracts. And as part of that, now that 
we'll continue to look at alternatives yes. uh, to gain cost efficiencies in, in what we do. Not, not in cut services, but certainly in efficiency that hasn't been achieved that we will see it in the next couple of years. Correct. This is a huge external cost for us, and I'm open to creative solutions. And I think partnering with other organizations would be interesting. And I know it's quite an endeavor to kind of have us take on to some extent. And I hope that we continue to keep options in front of us and, and look at them going forward. And I'm appreciative that the Flint County ESC under new leadership is working to get their costs down. And if there's other ways we can inspire and help them in that process, I hope we can. Gentle nudge. Mr. Miller. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Mr. Wolf. Aye. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Mr. Janice. Aye. Uh, consent agenda 1401A through C D. D. A through D. Okay. Second. Okay. Uh, I'd like to call a couple items to your attention. Um, we have a couple of uh, donations that we appreciate um, our community members thinking of us uh, when, when it comes time to donate either materials or money. So we appreciate that. The other uh, item under supplemental contracts, the hiring of Justin Buttermore, uh, who is going to be our head coach uh, for football. Very excited about uh, Coach Buttermore. He's definitely got an energy and enthusiasm that I think will be fantastic. And, you know, he's replacing J.R. Waite, who had very big shoes to fill. Um, and so he's inheriting a really good program. And I think his uh, perspective is to bring it to a great program. He is also listed under certified contracts under GHS social studies teacher. Um, Sean, this is kind of a domino effect, but let me share with you what has happened. So um, remember, Mr. Kruger left in seventh grade uh, science. Meg Holler, who is a current social studies teacher, is also certified in biology she, and, and science. She wanted the science position, so we transferred her internally. Sean Felder, who is currently teaching high school social studies, wanted to move to the middle school. He did our middle school play. He, he likes that age range. And so that transfer was granted, which opened up the position for uh, Mr. Buttermore to come in. And uh, Justin has taught AP US history um, at Tri-Valley before. So um, I think this is uh, surprising that all of these things aligned. Um, quite honestly, and, and I'm very thankful. Uh, Kevin, Matt did a fantastic job of running that process, and uh, I think we have a great football coach and a great teacher. So uh, excited about that. Um, we have uh, may, I, Meg may I add something to what sure. you just said? So I, I was asked to be part of the final interviews, and I want to commend the district and the staff for the way it was, it was run. It was very well run. Um, I liked how it was set up. That because we don't, we as the outsiders, as I called ourselves, we don't know what goes into the teaching position and those sort of sort of things. So the the process, you took care of all those details, um, and they presented some great candidates. We were really lucky, the folks that that applied, mm -hmm. and that you came down to. So. Just wanted to commend everyone for that Thank you. process. It was a good, I thought it was a very good process. Thank you. And then the only other thing that I would hi highlight is Megan Strayer's actual resignation at the end. And Megan has served our, our staff or our students very well in her role as an intervention specialist. And we hate to see her go, but we do appreciate um, all that she has done for our students. And we wish her the best of luck. And then we have a couple of field trips. Which are parents sponsor? Yeah. Uh, parents, parents pay for those um, trips. Yes. Questions? No. 
Ms. Davis. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Mr. Wolf. Aye. Mr. Jennings. Aye. That brings us to financials. <coughs> um, so the first is the monthly financial report for February. Second. Second. Um, you have the report in your folder. Um, I will take a few more minutes than I normally do just to bring Mr. Wolf up a little bit on what the report looks like on a monthly basis. Um, I will actually offer to probably in the next couple of weeks for him to come in for us to sit down and go through right. <coughs> well, finances. There, there will be a new board member orientation process. I yes. apologize in advance. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't, nobody told me. Yeah. <laughs> now that you're in, some people are <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, so I will briefly go through this um, for Mr. Wolf's benefit, starting with page four, which is the comparison to the October forecast. Um, overall, again, there's nothing new here that we have not seen before where um, the forecast has gotten a little bit weaker in the short run, but better in the long run um, because of the insurance choices that the staff made at our open enrollment um, for the new insurance. Um, because more chose the higher deductible plan, there was more upfront costs from the HSA. You'll actually see a slide that addresses this near the end. Um, but that does create longer term savings um, to the district. Um, our year over year revenue on page five um, is inflated right now um, because of the timing of our property tax payments coming from the county. Um, they are running ahead of last year, which just means that we've gotten them a little bit faster. Uh, I am expecting the settlement this week. Um, I have in discussions um, with um, some of my business partners over the weekend or in our call yesterday, a couple of them who've already gotten their settlements have seen upticks um, in their first half collections because of the change in federal tax law. And a lot of people prepaying their entire oh, yeah. 2018 mm -hmm. obligation mm -hmm prior to January 1st. Um, this will tend to be more concentrated in more affluent areas, of course, which we are one. Um, so I would not be surprised if once we get the settlement, if it looks a quite a bit stronger than last year. Keep in mind what that will mean is that our July and August payments will look correspondingly weaker. Um, so this year may look a little bit better, um, and next year may look a little next this year may look a little bit weaker um, because of the timing shift. Again, I should have a much better idea of that probably at least by, by next week. Um, we're expecting the settlements, you know, based on what we heard from the county, sometime late this week. Um, on the expenditure side, um, expenditures are about 5% ahead of last year. Um, that is, you know, the biggest chunk of that is in benefits. That is because of the change in, in the benefit structure and the health insurance structure where we have made a lot of upfront payments into HSAs. Um, so that has inflated our expenditures in the short run. That will be offset as we move through um, the next nine months. Um, if you take a look on page seven, our <coughs> revenues compared to estimates, again, they are running quite a bit above right now, but you'll see that's all in real estate for the same reasons we just talked about. The money is coming in a little bit faster. It may again be a little bit ahead this ha this half payment. And the re these would be the first tax payments that include the reappraisal of values, which would not impact our overall revenue that we generate, but it, it would will, improve the shuffle of I mean, where it comes from, we're except for the outside. We're expecting about a 1.4, 1.5% net increase because of the reappraisal. So that's going to cause some of it to, that's going to cause some of it's going to be actual growth, but then we may also see from the timing. So I think we'll see a combination. Um, our expenditures are running, again, also ahead of estimate. But again, all of those are in two areas. Um, 
the benefits is is a big chunk of that again because of the health insurance and the um, if you look at debt intergovernmental that is just because I did not put the payments on the lease the lease purchase I did not put one in December that we were going to have they're all actually listed in June and so that will correct itself by the end of the year as well the payments themselves are exactly what we're expecting it's just the timing is not what i put in the forecast um monthly cash flow uh monthly cash balances we are remaining above our um our adopted um, targets other than in january of next year um which is our low point of the year from finances we do bump back up above that again after january although you will see by june of next year um, again without any influx from the levy we are finishing the year right at that the level where we want our cash balances to be which means going forward we will start moving below that threshold beyond fiscal year 2019 um, current cash, we have nine and a half million dollars of cash. Um, this is the point of the year where we are most flush um, because we are getting our property tax settlements. Um, we will hit our peak amount next month, about the end of this month, when we get our final property tax settlements will be our high point of the year in cash. And this is cash across all funds, not just in the, the operating fund. The two pieces I wanted to, to point out that are um, extra this month, um, page 11, you will see um, this is our medical premium expenses. Um, the HSA contributions are not in here. They are in a different object code. But you see, starting in January, the very sharp, sharp drops in our medical premiums um, for both certified and classified staff as the new um, the new healthcare um, program has come into effect, um, and again, this will make up for the additional HSA payments that we made um, at the beginning of January as we work through the rest of this calendar year. Um, the last page is just an update of our electricity expenditures. Um, I provided this a couple months ago as we just look at the impacts of the. Um, the energy project that was completed over the summer with the retrofitting of all the lights and the sensors and you can see our electric costs through the first nine months of the year um, are down about 14 percent from where they were last year last year you see that zero in march but you also look back in august and there were two months payments back in august so we actually got back onto a normal schedule um, in march and you see a big drop and then dip between January and March of this year. Um, that was an AEP change in their billing and metering. And we, in our February bill did not include all of our buildings. Uh, I know that we did not get billed for the intermediate school in February. Um, there may have been some other bills that we did not get. And so that's why February is low and March is high, um, is because of the timing of the billing from AEP. Thank you, Mike. Any questions? I, I have one. Yeah. What, can you just let me know on page 11, what's the difference between certified staff and classified staff? Certified staff are primarily our teachers and others who are paid off of the certified salary schedule. Okay. Classified staff is everybody else. Okay. They have a teaching certification. Is that what they, they have a teaching? Is? They have a teaching certification and are hired as a teacher because right. we do have some classified staff who have teaching certifications but have not been hired in a certified position. Okay. But Thanks. that's that's the distinction. Thank you. Any other questions? No. Mr. Miller. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Mr. Wolf. Aye. Ms. Deeds? Aye. Mr. Janice? Aye. Um, the next is the um, adoption of our tax rates for the current year. I will second Amy's motion. Okay. 
That really did sound like it. <laughs> I know it didn't, wasn't Fred. That's all I knew. <laughs> I'm waiting for the adjournment part yeah. to step up. Okay, wait, wait. Hold <laughs> we will let you. This is the resolution we normally pass each, pass each year in January. Um, I did not put it in front of the board in January because um, of the errors in the data that I found from the county. And I, I was not willing to have you adopt our tax rates until the county actually got them correct. Um, they are now correct um, based on the, the data and have been revised. So um, I am comfortable with you adopting them when actually we have to because they need to be adopted by March 31st. Um, but they are correct, so I was fine putting it in front of you at this point. Okay. Questions? Ms. Deeds? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Dr. Corman? Aye. Mr. Wolf? Aye. Mr. Janice? Aye. President Janice, would you allow me to, before we adjourn, I would like to recognize Dan Katona, yes. who is in the audience. He has sat patiently through this entire <laughs> meeting. He was going to speak in public comment. However, he is our levy chair, and he has been uh, working diligently with our steering committee, we, meeting weekly um, to really uh, set the stage for informing our community about this ballot issue, and that's their job. And and we, Dan, Dan went into this with the potential for it being a co-chair, and like others on this board, got schnookered by me um, <laughs> into it being a chair position. So he is carrying the load, um, but has a great team supporting him. But I wanted to recognize him and thank him for his service. And hopefully all of you can, after the adjournment, can at least, uh, if you don't know Dan, introduce yourselves. You have our gratitude. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you. The hard work that you and your community are doing. Thank you. And our support. Does anybody care to make a motion to adjourn? <laughs> so moved. <laughs> Second. <laughs> Mr. Wolf. Aye. Ms. Deeds. Aye. Dr. Corman. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Mr. Janice. Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you. Woo! You always have one seat at board member who says no. <laughs> <laughs>